In this presentation, I'm going to introduce the idea of a factorial experimental design. So we're talking here about designed experiments. And that means we're thinking about an experiment or being able to control some factors that are of interest and specifically be able to control the levels of these factors. So we've talked about factors and levels uh, previously uh, and uh, uh, you can refer to your previous materials for definition. But in an experiment, the idea that the experimenter can control the levels of the factors is very important. Uh, control is really key to the idea that it's an experiment. And of course, randomization is going to be very important uh, in order to make our experiments valid. Now we're going to be talking about factorial experiments uh, in this, these slides. And factorial experiments involve two or more factors that uh, you're uh, interested in, uh, things like perhaps uh, temperature or pressure or both. Uh, and each of these factors is going to take on a fixed number of levels. Uh, so for example, we may set temperature at low or high, we may set pressure at low, medium or high, and so on. A full factorial experiment involves collecting generally the same number of repl replicates at every possible combination of the factors. And it's the fact that you're collecting data at all combinations of the factors that makes this a factorial experiment. Here's a quick aside which is important. Uh, you may be wondering why we're even considering dealing with more, more than one factor at a time. Uh, it is generally far more efficient to change more than one factor at once when you're running your experiments than to do a one variable at a time uh, sequential experimental process where you manipulate first one variable and then the next and so on. Uh, furthermore, if you manipulate the variables at the same time in a sensible way, you actually get more information than if you try to do experimentation one variable at a time. So we're going to be thinking about cases where you change more than one variable at once. Now back to the factorial designs. Um, for example, let's suppose that we have an experiment where there are four factors that we're interested in and each of them takes on three distinct levels. That means that there are going to be three times three times three times three, that is three to the fourth, which is 81 distinct experimental settings. If in addition you are going to run five replicates at each of these 81 set settings, that means there's going to be 5 times 81 or 405 runs. So that's 5 times 3 to the 4th. As another example, if there are 5 factors each at 2 levels with 3 distinct replicates, there are, then there are going to be 2 to the 5th, which is 32 distinct experimental settings, each of which will have to occur 3 times, one for each replicate. So the total number of runs that we need is going to be 3 times 2 to the 5th, or 96 runs. Uh, in another experiment, for example, we might have three factors A, B, and C. And in this case, we're going to allow the factors to take on different numbers of levels. So for example, A may take on two levels, B may take on four levels, C may take on three levels, uh, and let's suppose there are going to be five replicates then the number of distinct experimental combinations is going to be 2 times 4 times 3. 2 for the first, the levels of the first factor, 4 for the 4 levels of the second, and 3 for the 3 levels of the third. And then we need to multiply that by 5 replicates for each of the distinct experimental combinations, and that gives 120 runs. I want to emphasize once again that once you have the 120 runs that you need to make, the settings that you need to make for these 120 runs, it's very important to randomize the settings. Otherwise, the validity of your experiment uh, is in question. Now there is something called fractional factorial designs that you may have heard of, and we're going to discuss these later. But I just wanted to acknowledge that term so that if you have heard it, you're not wondering uh, if this is what we're going to be talking about in these slides. It isn't. As I say, we're going to get to fractional factorials a little bit later. When most people use the term factorial design, they don't mean designs as general as the ones we've been talking about. 
What they generally do mean, however, is a design that has a large number of factors, usually three or more, and each of those is going to be measured at two levels, low or high, absent, present, etc. So we're now narrowing our focus to what most people mean when they casually use the term factorial design. It's going to be a design with a large number of factors at two levels. When there are only two levels of the factors, it's possible to easily estimate the analysis of variance using regression. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so the estimation procedure um, that I'm now going to use for factorial experiments with only two levels for each factor will be based on just using uh, regression, uh, either inside of Excel or in some other program such as Jump. When there are more than two levels, the relationship between analysis of variance and regression is not straightforward, uh, as I've shown you uh, in, in previous uh, presentation. Um, so, in that case, regression is not a very useful way to try to estimate the, the analysis of variance. Uh, but in this particular case, where there are only two levels, uh, it's quite easy to do, and, and for simplicity, and in order to avoid introducing other methods, uh, we're going to stick with estimating these analysis of variance uh, with regression. Now, when you have high-order designs, that means designs with a lot of factors, and more than two levels, it's perfectly possible to push through the machinery that we've developed for doing analysis of variance and do these by brute force, okay, using the techniques we've done. It can be done, but it's painful. And this is one of the reasons why people tend to limit their, um, their designs, their factorial designs, to only considering two levels. Now, all of the methods that we're going to be studying are balanced designs, and they require balanced designs. And what a balanced design means is that you have the same number of rep replicates at each of the possible settings of the, uh, of the factors. There is a method that you may read about in the textbook or other places called the Yates method. And uh, it used to be difficult prior to computing being widespread to uh, compute uh, ANOVAs. And so various methods were, were developed, including the Yates method. Um, I consider the Yates method obsolete, uh, and so we're not going to study it. So once again, why two-level factorial designs? Well, uh, even though computing is cheap, when you have more than two levels, it greatly increases the number of experimental conditions that you need to run, and therefore your overall sample size. And while computing may be cheap, collecting data in most cases is not. Furthermore, once you have more than two levels, and quite frankly, even with two levels, Understanding exactly what's going on can be very difficult, uh, particularly when you start looking at what's happening, uh, going on in what's called higher order interactions. It's, it's higher nonlinearity in the, in the data set. So having two levels greatly aids the interpretation of the results. So now we need a little bit of notation. Um, when we talk about a two-level full factorial experiment with p factors, we're going to use the notation 2 to the p. So for example, if we have three factors, we're going to use the notation 2 to the 3, four factors 2 to the 4, and so on. So the 2 to the p only refers to the unique number of experimental conditions that you're going to have. For example, if you have two levels and two factors, then there are going to be 2 to the 2 or 4 experimental conditions. If you have R replicates, then you're going to need R times 2 to the P observations. So when we talk about a 2 to the 3 experimental uh, factorial design, uh, we know there are going to be eight unique experimental conditions. But if there are then replicates on top of that, uh, we're going to have, as a total number of experimental conditions, the number of replicates times 2 to the 3. 
So here is a useful formula um, that's going to come up. Uh, there is this notation that is read uh, P choose X. So it's the P over the X in parentheses is read P choose X. And it's defined as P factorial divided by X factorial times P minus X factorial. Uh, and in particular, this is going to give us the number of two-way interaction terms among uh, P factors. So, for example, uh, on the bottom of the page, if we have five factors and we have, uh, are interested in the number of two-way interactions, then the number of two-way interactions among five factors is going to be 5 choose 2, which is 5 factorial all divided by 2 factorial times uh, 5 minus 2, which is 3 factorial, which works out to be 10. Similarly, we can use this, uh, this P choose X notation formula in order to figure out uh, the number of three-way interactions among five factors and so on. Okay, so you can use this formula to figure out how many interaction terms that you have among of a, of a certain order, like 2, 3, 4, whatever, among a, a large number of factors. Now I'm going to end this video at this point, uh, and then we'll start up in part 2 in just a minute uh, to actually show you the factorial designs, the 2 to the p factorial designs that we're going to be using. And those are going to be found in the file 659 factorial designs uh, .xlsx. So I'm going to conclude at this point uh, in order to turn to the example in the Excel file in the next video.